Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to a little tardiness on our five hundred. It is five hundred six or December seventh land use transportation committee uh, meeting. So I'm going to call this meeting to order. And our second item is public comment. I believe we have Mr. Gregory Bush that wants to make a comment. One moment, and Mr. Bush, you are now allowed to talk. Good evening, this is Greg Bush uh, with Wireless Policy Group giving comments on behalf of AT&T. I'd like to confirm that my microphone works first. We can hear Yes, it is. All right, I'd like to give comments on the agenda item relating to the updates to the Federal Way Code for wireless communications facilities. Uh, wireless Policy Group's offices are in Issaquah, Washington. So first I'd like to thank staff for all their work in uh, updating this code. There have been a lot of updates uh, in the technology as well as federal law this year and staff is, has an undoubtedly heavy end of year load and they've been working diligently to work with industry and to develop code that is workable. And I'm confident that with staff's help, we can develop a clear, clean code that keeps up with the recent advances in federal law and technology. And I would also like to ask the committee to remember the importance of macro facilities while we're also discussing the wireless code. Small wireless facilities allow uh, coverage to be brought to the immediate area, but macro facilities are the larger facilities responsible for providing coverage to com uh, entire communities. And with the 2018 update to the wireless code, uh, there are a significant number of options have been taken off the table for providing coverage to residential areas. And since 2007, AT&T has seen data usage on its network increase by more than 580,000%. Right now, more than well over half of Washington state homes no longer use traditional landline telephone service and instead are wireless only. Nationwide, four and five adults aged 25 to 29, 81.7%, uh, and age 30 to 34, 81.1%, are wireless only. And wireless communications are also critical for first responders, uh, first responders in emergency situations. And macro facilities, again, are the backbone of AT&T's network, AT network, and they'll continue to be the backbone of AT&T's network. These facilities are also equipped to run on generators that run in the event of a power outage, whereas small wireless facilities do not have these generators. Small wireless facilities are not meant to replace macro facilities, and macro facilities are critical in maintaining AT&T's network. Thank you. And you're Gary. Uh, in, the, in the rush to get the meeting started, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to uh, introduce the committee. I'm the chair, Greg Russo, and I have council members Tran and Moore as our committee, and we have other council members present. Please introduce yourselves. Um, council President Susan Honda, thank you. <laughs> council member Lydia Sapa Dawson. Welcome, thank you. We're gonna move on to committee business now. Item B, Downtown Staircase Project Acceptance and Christine Mullen, floor is yours. Point of order, Mr. Chair. I'm so sorry, Christine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I believe we need to pass the minutes. Is that not correct? Oh, yeah, I, I wouldn't move that. Yep, I'm so sorry. My Item A, Christine. no, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Approval of minutes, November 2nd, 2020. So I hope everyone we had a chance to take a look at those. I, I move the, the minutes as they have been submitted. Thank you. Thank you. And I, motion. I will second that. Motion seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Pass, thank you. Pass unanimously approval minutes for the number of a second. Now, Christine, I will move to item B. Thank okay. you. Downtown staircase. Okay. Let me share my screen here. All right, I'm here to present the Downtown Staircase Project Acceptance. And I'm Christine Mullen. I'm a capital engineer in the Public Works Department. Christine, I don't think we're seeing the right screen share on yours. We're seeing your Zoom login. Okay. 
Christine, you might have to stop, stop sharing and reshare. Okay, I'll try that. Is that showing up for you guys now? There you go. Okay. All right. Okay, but it's not doing anything for me here. Okay. All right, so the policy question before us tonight is, should the council accept the downtown staircase project as complete? So for some background information, this project, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, constructed the staircase in the downtown area um, along with an ADA accessible ramp. And this was at the extension of 21st Avenue South at South 316th Street. So here's um, a picture here showing the before where we had that large 20 foot tall wall along there and there was no way to move from uh, the lower area there up to the upper parking lot area. And then we have the post construction photo there showing the beautiful sidewalk project. Here's a couple other photos at the ribbon cutting we had almost exactly a year ago. And then just some other photos of the finished project. So the approved construction contract amount for this project was just over 2.8 million. So that included the low bid as well as the 10% contingency. Um, the final construction contract amount was just over $2.6 million. So the balance remaining on this project was $269,532.79. So the options for consideration tonight are one, to authorize final acceptance of the downtown staircase project constructed by RL Alia Incorporated in the amount of $2,607,386.31 as complete. Or the second option is do not authorize final acceptance of the downtown staircase project as complete and provide direction to staff. The mayor's recommendation is to forward option one to the January 5th, 2021 city council consent agenda for approval. Any questions? Thank you, Christine. Uh, I have a question from uh, Council Member Moore, Committee Member Moore. Go ahead, Martin. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Christine, uh, obviously, what a huge difference uh, there is the before and after, right? And uh, uh, I think uh, this is a project that I've been uh, pretty excited about since I first heard about it. And that connectivity from the lower downtown to the upper part uh, really just enhances uh, um, our community in so many different ways. Uh, so that's really exciting, more of a comment there. Um, because I've, I've seen a lot of our constituents talking about this, can you just kind of run down through the numbers again? Um, because I know that uh, we used um, funding that if A, if we didn't use it, we would have lost it, and B, it could only be used and projects like such as this. Uh, can you just kind of go over that I, again, just to kind of remind uh, people that are gonna be watching right now and later on? Right, I don't have the exact dollar amount in front of me, but yes, we did have a um, lift grant for this project that was only able to be used in this downtown area. And it funded um, almost all of the construction phase of the project. I don't have those exact dollar amounts in front of me, but yeah, it, it was primarily funded with that lift grant. Right, and it can, like you just stated, it can only be used for such projects, and that's it. Correct, yes, that is correct. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Council Member Sefa Dawson. Yeah, thank you, Council Chair. Um, Christine, this was under budget, right, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way the funds, the, the leftover funds could be used maybe to for additional lighting or anything that within the project? Is that something that we would consider or we could consider? Um, at this point, I mean, our construction contractor is was done with the project almost a year ago. I mean, we've been waiting to close out the plan establishment for the project. So to get the same contractor back out there to do work might be quite expensive. I mean, to add anything additional onto the design at this point, I mean, that would involve 
doing additional design as well as construction because they built everything that was in the original plans. I mean, not to say that we couldn't do additional improvements out there if that was the direction of council, but it would probably be with a new contractor and new going out to bid, all of that. Hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Tran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Christine, thank you for uh, your presentation. I just want to comment that uh, uh, the uh, staircase is very, very beautiful. Um, and uh, uh, the fact that uh, you know you guys did a good job of bringing this down uh, under the budget, that's, uh, that's really, uh, really nice. Um, so I just want to say thank you and thank you uh, for the staff that involved in this project. Thank you. Yes, I have a personal goal of never going over budget on a project. And in my almost eight years at the city, I've never touched contingency. This project has been the closest, <laughs> but I still managed to be under budget. Very you appreciate. said never, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Martin. <laughs> All right, any other questions from anyone else? You're I'm ready to make a motion. Go ahead. We I'll take the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move to forward option one to the January 5th, 2021, a better year for all consent agenda for approval. I'll second, I'll second that. Have a motion by Councilmember Martin and seconded by Councilmember Tran. Any other discussions on the motion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Unanimously, three to zero. Thank you very much. Christine, you're gonna stay with us for a while because- yeah. uh, you have a bunch of other items in here. And uh, again, reminder to our council members and those listening, if you have it, the C items C through F came, uh, can be referenced on our capital projects book 2020-2026. So Christine, the floor is yours. All right, let me get my screen sharing again. Okay, can you guys see that PowerPoint? Okay. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to talk about the Southwest Dash Point Road at 47th Avenue Southwest Compact Roundabout. This is the 85% design report and authorization to bid. So the policy question before you tonight is, should the city council authorize staff to bid the Southwest Dash Point Road and 47th Avenue Southwest Compact Roundabout and then return to the LUTC and council for bid award for the reports and authorization. So this project will install a compact roundabout at the intersection of Southwest Dash Point Road and 47th Avenue Southwest. And Dash Point Road is also SR 509, it's a state route. And then along with the roundabout, there will be also associated storm drainage and street lighting improvements. And this roundabout is proposed for this intersection as a countermeasure countermeasure to the fatal and serious injury collision history at this T intersection. So here's just a photo showing the existing conditions. So it is stop controlled on 47th Avenue Southwest, which is also um, like the extension of Hoyt Road. And then there's no stop control along Dash Point. So to this point in the project, we've completed the TOPO survey, have project design completed to 85%, We've coordinated with the utilities to get their relocation work done. We have approval of our NEPA, which is our federal environmental documentation. We have our SEPA application completed. And then um, we've completed some public outreach. When we initially talked to um, property owners within 300 feet of the project, we had um, some feedback from property owners. And so uh, just last week, I held an online open house for this um, project that invited all those neighbors as well as anybody in the community to discuss the progress of the project with them. So that was a nice way to reach out to the community, inform about what's going on. So moving forward, we're going to finish the design to 100%, finish the contract specifications, get that SEPA approval completed, and then a channelization plan approval, which is by washed up since it is a state route. This here just kind of shows what the proposed improvements are for the intersection. It's a compact roundabout, so they're a little bit smaller in size. It's one lane in each direction going through the roundabout. And then we will have a crosswalk on 47th and along one leg of Dash Point Road 
and then um, there's not sidewalks being put in. It's um, a paved shoulder that's separated by extruded curb from the roadway. This here is kind of a similar project. This is the one that went in, um, I think two years ago at Military in 298. That was a compact roundabout. So I think this is a good photo that showed what it will look like. For the estimated expenditures, the design costs 175,000 for estimating the construction cost to be 660,000. Then with 10% contingency, construction and management and inspection at 129. So the total project cost will be just over a million. Um, we have a federal grant for this project for 815,000. And then right now we only have 15,000 in city miscellaneous transfer from other CIP projects. So our total bu budget right now is 830,000. So right now it does look as if there's a $200,000 shortfall. We've been tracking um, the cost as we've been designing the project. So we were aware of that. Um, and so once we open the bids and we would know the total amount that would be needed to be transferred to this project, when we go for um, bid approval, then we would also request a transfer from different funds to fund this shortfall. So the options for consideration are one, to authorize staff to bid the Southwest Dash Point Road and 47th Avenue Southwest Compact Roundabout Project and return to the LUTC and Council for bid award, further reports and authorization. Or option two is do not authorize staff to bid this project and provide direction to staff. The mayor recommends forwarding option one to the January 5th, 2021 City Council Consent Agenda for approval. Any questions? Thank you, Christine, presentation. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. Um, so on the on the public comment, was it pretty much positive, number one? And then the second question is, um, do we have to widen it at all or are we just using that existing area for that roundabout? We are not widening very much. In the actual roundabout area, we are a little bit just because to fit a circle into a rectangular intersection right now, we have to widen a little bit on the north side. Everything is happening within the current city right-of-way that we don't need to acquire any right-of-way. But okay. um, we tried very hard not to widen very much just so that we wouldn't trigger additional stormwater requirements. Right, because that tails off down, kind of goes downhill a little bit. If I remember right, kind right. of tapers down. Right. So again, thank you. And um, as far as public comments at the open house, um, everybody has been very excited about the project. Um, all the neighbors who we've talked to had um, safety concerns because there have been fatalities at that intersection or um, a lot of speeding through that area. And a roundabout should help both of those um, conditions. I agree because there's pretty good blind spot when you're coming off of um, the 320th area and want to make a left there around that turn. So right. thank you. And um, one thing to note is based on the public input we got early on, we have added, um, normally we would have a roundabout ahead sign on each leg of the intersection. And instead we're having um, roundabout ahead signs that have flashers on them to draw a little bit extra attention because there are some curves in that area. And so we looked for ways to really make sure that people would be aware that there would be a roundabout and it didn't surprise them. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Council President Honda. Thank you. Um, I grew up in, in this area, so I've been driving that road since I was, was a baby. And I, I do know of, of accidents there. Um, however, when you held the second community meeting or, or you held the community meeting last week to listen to concerns, if everyone was happy about it, why did you hold another meeting? Were there in, was there anyone that is not happy about it or had concerns no, about that? The first one wasn't a meeting. So back in March or April, I sent letters out to all residences that were within 300 feet of the project and basically just say, heads up, we're going to be designing a project. It'll be constructed, you know, later this year or next year. And in response to that, I got a lot of phone calls and emails saying, hey, you know, are you aware people have been killed here? Are you aware that, you know, a lot of people speed through here? So just in response to those comments, we said, hey, there's enough public interest in this one. We want to hold an open house to get back in touch with those people. Let them know we've done things like add the flashing signs, make sure they know that we're listening and are hearing things. Oh, OK. Um, so as you're coming from the Dash Point area, there's the, the 
curve and then there'll be the roundabout. Will there be a sign warning drivers that they're to slow down, that there's a roundabout coming up? Yes, that's what I'm talking about on each, from coming from every single direction, there will be a sign that says roundabout ahead. And on this one, they will have the flashing lights on them to make sure people notice those signs a little bit more. Okay, and I, I do have one concern. The roundabout's on 330th, which I do like. Um, I live in that area, so I go through them on a daily basis. The crosswalk is something that you actually don't even notice. And I'm hoping that um, there could be something that you could make the crosswalk more apparent to the drivers that are, for instance, coming out of my neighborhood. If someone is in that crosswalk, I'm probably, I may not see them because I'm looking to make sure that someone's going to stop on 330th and not hit me if they're coming um, and not slowing down or so I, I'm a little concerned about the crosswalks and the, and the location to the roundabout. Um, so the location is pretty standard for where they are in relation to the roundabout. The crosswalks are supposed to be offset a little bit from the circle itself so that it, it doesn't directly in, um, impede with the traffic. They are separated a little bit. Um, for this project, with the street lighting that we're putting in, we are going to have a street light um, near each of the crosswalks to make sure that they are well lit and more noticeable that way so that they wouldn't be like on a dark part of the road. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions at all? I don't see any. Um, so if that's the case, then I will take a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to forward option one to the January 5th, 2020, 2021 consent agenda for approval. Thank you, Councilmember Trans. Your second? Yes, I'll second that. Okay, motion by Councilmember Trans, seconded by Councilmember Moore. Any other discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously 3 0. Thank you. We're on to item D again with Christine, Pacific Highway South non-motorized corridor, 30% design report. Okay, Christine. Okay. Okay, can you guys see that PowerPoint okay? Yes. yes. All right. Okay. Like I said, this is the Pacific Highway South non-motorized corridor 30% design report. So the policy question before you tonight is, should the city council authorize staff to proceed with the design of the Pacific Highway South non-motorized corridor project and return to the LUTC and council at 85% design completion for further reports and authorization? So this project provides a non-motorized shared use path along the Pack Highway South Corridor from South 308th Street to 288th Street. The improvements include an asphalt path slash trail, minor grading, stormwater infrastructure, pedestrian illumination, and some retaining wall. So this project, I know, I think all of you were um, in our non-motorized um, conversation we had last week. But this project is really important to the city um, for both local connections and also regional connections. So this project here is the red line there. Um, and then along 308, there's a planned bike boulevard. So to the south, this project will end up tying in directly to our downtown city core area, like near the Sound Transit Station. It will provide non-motorized access to there. Then to the north, there's planned improvements in Des Moines that would take us to the Des Moines City Center and on to SeaTac. And then to the east, we have the planned bike lane along 288th Street, which then ties into planned improvements in Auburn, which takes us over to that purple line, which is the inner urban trail. So this project is just really important for tying us in with a regional non-motorized network. Uh, this here shows the location of the project. It's the pink line there running along. So again, it runs from 308 up to 288. Um, a portion of it runs along Pack Highway, 
a portion of it runs along uh, 16th Avenue South, then it runs along Redondo, and then it cuts down into um, an unopened city right of way and then some, an easement area along there to the north. And um, we call it the Pack Highway Non-Motorized Trail Project, and only a short section of it is along Pack Highway. Um, and that is because Pack Highway has some of the highest traffic volumes in the city and also some of the highest um, accident rates in the city, particularly between vehicles and pedestrians. So pedestrians and non-motorized users just don't feel um, as comfortable along a high volume facility like Pack Highway. So this project is the number one project in the city's bike and ped plan. And the plan has always been that it would be along this parallel route to Pack Highway to serve those non-motorized users. Uh, here's a couple photos showing what it looks like out there right now. Um, along 16th Avenue South, there is a sidewalk in places. It's pretty narrow though. I think it's maybe four feet wide and our trail will be 12 feet wide. Um, and then along Redondo Way, we just have that paved shoulder along the road. And then the picture on the right there is the unopened right of way or easement that's running um, past Railandum. So this shows a little bit about what the trail would look like. This would be the area that is currently the unopened right of way or easement. So it'll be a nice 10 foot trail with gravel shoulders on both sides. We will have pedestrian scale illumination. And then this is what it will look like along 16th Avenue South. So we will still have the vehicle lanes. We will add curb gutter and sidewalk to help separate the non-motorized users from the roadway. We'll have a landscape buffer and then the uh, trail. So to date, we have completed the topo survey. We've evaluated some different alternatives in key locations along the trail. Um, we've completed project design to 30%. We've coordinated with WashDOT um, because we cross Dash Point Road, which is a state route. Um, we've coordinated with the school district, and then we've held online neighborhood meetings. Um, we held those for residential areas to the north, residential areas to the south, and then commercial users. Moving forward, we will be working on utility coordination. We're planning to have an online open house for this project um, in a couple months. We have to prepare the right-of-way plans and then prepare preliminary contract specs, take the project design to 85%, and then get our uh, environmental NEPA and SEPA applied for and approved. For the cost for this project, um, the design, we have a consultant working on this, it's 775,000. Uh, for right-of-way acquisition, it's estimated at 1.1 million. The construction is just over 5 million, and then a 10% contingency, and then construction management and inspection. So our total project costs are estimated at just over 8.4 million. For the available funding, we have two grants that we've received for this project through PSRC, an STP grant and a CMAT grant. So the um, STP won 550,000, that's for the engineering and the 725,000, that's towards the right-of-way phase. We have REIT funds for this project and some traffic impact fees. So we have a total available budget of 1.5 million. So you can see that we have a funding shortfall right now of just over $6.8 million. But breaking news, I'm very excited to say that um, we found out just this afternoon that this project has ranked um, number three in the state for safe routes to school funding. Um, that's something that needs to go to the state legislator for approval. So we wouldn't receive official award until 2021, but um, we're looking, um, we're on the list to receive an additional one point, I think it's just over $1.8 million for this project through that source of funds. And then, um, which will make us more competitive as we continue to apply for grants for construction in future years. The options for consideration are one, to authorize staff to proceed with the design of the Pacific Highway South non-motorized corridor project and return to the LUTC and council at 85% design completion for further reports and authorization, or two, do not authorize staff to proceed with this project and provide direction to staff. The mayor's recommendation is to forward option one to the January 5th, 2021 city council consent agenda for approval. Any questions? Thank you, Christine. I have a question from uh, Councilmember Seva Dawson. 
Yeah, thank you, Christine. Um, since this has um, has to go to the um, legislation for approval, I wonder if this is something that we, if we could be specific on the legislative agenda when we meet with uh, Bill, and maybe it's not for you, Christine, the question is for the other council members, and specifically request for this funding to cover um, the cost here and to be sure that this is what we want on our legislative agenda. So it's just something I wanted to point out to other council members. Thank you. Council President Honda. Uh, thank you. So I was asked, going to talk about that too, council member Sephardson. I think it's probably something that we should push up to the top of that sheet of our legislative agenda so that it is clearly visible to our legislators and they know that we need them to be working on this as quickly as possible. So uh, we can talk to Bill about that. I, but I, I think uh, as long as it's ranked number three in the state, it shouldn't have a problem, but we just need to make sure that our legislators know that we need them to be working on that as soon as they get there or before they get to Olympia. My um, my other question was for the grants that we have, is there a time limit that they have to be spent on? There is. There's always those kind of um, restrictions when we have federal funds. So the design one we are actively billing towards right now as we're working on the project, um, and the grant that we have for right of way, um, we're actually going to start using that either later this year or next year, and that's actually earlier than. Um, what we're required to. Okay, just thought I'd ask. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, President Alda, because I was kind of I was kind of wondering that myself. So, thank you, uh, Councilmember Moore. Thank you so much, um, Christine. You know, um, if you can, um, I see here a projected budget, uh, and it's, I see a shortfall. Can you just, I, I just really want to understand, um, obviously we have uh, grants and whatnot totaling up to 1.5, um, and the project costs 8.4, um, and obviously there's a shortfall of 6.8. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, the exciting news, obviously, is that we have another 1.8 pending legislative action. Uh, so there's still a shortfall. So how do we, what's, what's, help me understand that a little bit more. I just want to make okay. sure I'm clear headed on that. So when we originally scope a project, before we even start design, we kind of do a rough estimate and say, here's what we think it's going to cost. Okay. As we actually start designing and get some of the more specifics, you know, we might have some parts that end up being a little bit more expensive or some spots we might be able to get it through a little bit cheaper. Um, so as we proceed with the design, it helps us to refine those costs and get a more accurate cost of what it will cost to complete. We usually get grants as the project progresses. So a lot of times you might get a grant to start with that covers the engineering design phase, but we aren't gonna get a construction grant when we haven't even designed the project yet. So now that we're working on the design, that made us really um, in a good spot to get the grant that we received earlier this year for the right-of-way phase. So now that we have that grant, it made us really in a good spot to get this grant that we had notice of today that will be for construction phase. So then next time that there is a funding cycle through PSRC, we plan to take this project there and request construction phase funding for that. So we look for every opportunity we can find to try to find grant fundings. This project has done really well at it because it does have those regional benefits. Like I mentioned beforehand, where we're connecting in with all of the neighbors. And this is just, I mean, this is a pretty exciting project to work on because yeah. of the um, non-motorized benefits it does provide to the city. But um, so as we move forward and you know keep getting funding, I mean, we might have to, as in future budget years, we might say, okay, we need to identify some city funds to put towards this project. You know, it all depends on how successful we are with different grants along the way, but we definitely will keep planning to apply to help make up that shortfall as best we can. Got it. Got it. No, and I appreciate the explanation. So and it's obviously important to note that, you know, our vote is just to continue to move forward with with the design aspects. And in that time frame, um, 
we'll get a clearer idea of how much this is going to really cost us. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an estimate is what I'm kind of hearing you say. And the closer we get to 100 percent, um, help me out with the lingo here, 100% uh, ready to build. Um, right. Final plans. Final plans. Uh, then uh, we may not see that negative thing and we'll have more grants that are kind of, that will be coming through. So right. got it. Okay. Thanks so much, Christine. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Chair Baruso, this is Desiree. Can I add yes. a little bit to that? Go so ahead, um, an earlier question about timing. So um, one thing that we, you know, need to be aware of, and there's always some risk in when you accept federal funds, is when you accept federal funds for the design of a project, you have 10 years to get that project under construction. And so every two years, we are in front of PSRC getting money. And so like Christine shared, um, it was correct, you know, we've been there every two years, first with design, this last year, we got the right-of-way funds uh, we fully anticipate that the following cycle, two years from now, now like a year and a half from now, uh, when we apply, uh, we will be in a very good position to get the rest of the construction funds, which puts us well within that kind of 10 year time frame of your first federal money to when you start construction of the project. So. Thank you, Desiree. Customer Moore, did you have another question? Oh, okay. So, Council President Honda, you had another one? A question? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about when this trail is built out, about the maintenance of it. Are parks people are already uh, pretty thin, and hopefully when it's built out, we will have had the ability to add more, but probably not enough to even maintain what we currently have. So what would the maintenance on a trail like this look like? Um, Council President Honda, so I believe most of this trail in this particular one, we'd have to um, come up with an agreement between public works and parks of who this tra trail really will belong to and and we'll go arm wrestle uh, with them later on but okay. um, generally the maintenance the the most of the regular maintenance is going to be the pick up the litter and um, pick up the leaves and you know the vegetation type of things as far as uh, real physical, type of maintenance, you know, besides making sure that the, the lights are working, um, any uh, furniture that's out there or uh, trash cans or what we call street furniture, um, making sure that those stay clean and stay maintained. Um, and then the pavement itself uh, would fall into kind of the regular paving cycle for uh, when we would maintain a, a sidewalk or a path. Um, Yet I'm not really sure that the BPA trail has uh, received any uh, pavement um, since it was built. Um, I know there are some areas that probably need it. So I, I hear you. Um, that is generally something that that uh, we need to keep on the radar and we need to figure out how to make sure we can maintain the infrastructure we're building. Okay, thank you. It's always a concern that we build these amazing trails and parks, but or even the staircase, but don't necessarily have the staff that can maintain what we have. So, thank sure, you. Sure, Bruce. So, can I have one thing to that, too? So? Sure. Go ahead. So, um, Council President, I, I guess just in complete transparency, both parks and public works maintain different trails throughout the city. I mean, the BPA trail is obviously the largest one in the city, and that's maintained by parks. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of association citywide that they must maintain all of the trails because they maintain the BPA trail. Um, certainly they maintain many miles of that. The Hylobos Park Boardwalk Trail would be another great example um, of one that they maintain inside a park. Public Works also maintains trails. Most of our trails tend to be connection from road to road through neighborhoods. Um, so one that came up recently is the one in Heritage Woods that I know council heard about, um, you know, connecting to the adjacent neighborhood. So most of the time, 
um, when there are connections from road to road, they tend to fall on public works to maintain. So Desiree is right. We will have to go sit down with John and arm wrestle a little bit, but chances are this one's going to stay with public works for the maintenance. Not that that really makes it any better, but just in complete transparency to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, I will take a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I can uh, I can uh, make the motion on this. Councilmember Tran, yes, go ahead. I move to forward option one to the January 5th, 2021 consent agenda for approval. And I move, I'll second that. Motion by Councilmember Tran, second by Councilmember Moore. Any other discussion on the motion? You're in seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Passes 3-0. Thank you very much. Christina, I think this is your last one. Yeah. Item E, South 314th Street Improvements, 30% Design Report. The floor is yours. Okay, can you see this PowerPoint okay? Yes. All right. All right, so this one here is the South 314th Street Improvements 30% Design Report. The policy question is, should the city council authorize staff to proceed with the design of the South 314th Street Improvements and return to the LUTC and council at 85% design completion for further reports and authorization? This project um, provides improvements to bring this section of street. This is between um, on 314th between Pete von Reichbauer to 23rd. Um, so to bring that section of the street up to current city roadway standards, which includes curb and gutter, sidewalk, illumination, storm improvements, and street trees. So here's um, a graph graphic showing the location of this project. So it is that road that kind of cuts through near the Pack parking lot. We've got the pack here, the old Target building, and then the downtown staircase is in the area where that thumbtack is. So, so far we've completed the topographic survey and project design to 30%. Um, moving forward, we still need to coordinate with franchise utilities, prepare a right of way plan, um, prepare preliminary contract specifications, um, and the project design to 85% and then also the environmental documentation. These photos kind of show the existing conditions of the um, roadway out there. You can see that the pavement is not in great condition. There's either no sidewalks or um, very narrow sidewalks through there. Um, and then proposed, this here is the section that is in front of the Performing Arts and Events Center. And so the entire stretch would look like that on both sides of the street. For the estimated expenditures, the, um, we have the design at 300,000, right of way acquisition is a little bit over 1.6 million, construction is estimated at 2.4 million along with 10% contingency, and then construction management and inspection. So the total project cost is estimated at 4.9 million. Um, as far as available funding, we have a state grant for this project uh, for 300,000. And then the portion of the right of way that would be required from the city, the value of that to be donated is 830,000 with 1.13 million. So on this project, again, there is a, um, an apparent funding, budget funding shortfall of just over $3.7 million on this project. So as we move forward with the design, we would refine the total project costs and then present updated costs at the 85% um, design completion status. And um, for this project, we did receive that state grant towards the design. And um, similar to how I mentioned on the previous presentation, 
this is a project where right now we're really focused on working on the design and then we will see um, what grants become available to apply to for the for the right of way and construction phases. But if we have the design completed, we're much more competitive in applying for grant funds. Uh, the options for consideration are one, to authorize staff to proceed with the design of the South 314th Street improvements and return to the LUTC and council at 85% design completion for further reports and authorization. Or option two is do not authorize staff to proceed with this project and provide direction to staff. The mayor's recommendation is to forward option one to the January 5th, 2021 City Council Consent Agenda for approval. And any questions? Thank you, Christine. Any questions from anyone? If your job and plug in your laptop, I get. <laughs> <laughs> Did you All see right. it going off like this? <laughs> <laughs> it came up on the screen. Low battery. I was looking at mine. Me? In a way. I'm that sorry. was my iPad. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I'm sorry. Great job tonight, Christine. Okay. Hearing, seeing none, I will entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I move to forward option one to the January 5th, 2021, a better year for all of us. Consent agenda for approval. Second. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Moore, seconded by Councilmember Tran. Any other discussion on the motion? Here and seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. And we move on to item F, Lakota Middle School routes to school, 85% design status report and observation to bid. Jeff. How to uh, share screen. Good evening, Chair Peruso, committee members, council members. My name is Jeff Han. I'm the cap I'm the, um, the capital engineer for the city of Federal Way, and I'm presenting the Lakota Middle School Safe Route to School 85% uh, design status report to committee. Um, the policy question is, so the city council authorized staff to complete design and bid the Lakota Middle School Safe Route to School project and return to LUTC and council for better work for the report and authorization. Um, the financial impacts, uh, the cost to the city for Lakota Middle School safe route to school at Southwest Das Point Road was included within the approved budget under the Public Works Department capital project number 204. Uh, this item is funded by a federal grant from uh, WASHDOT and TIB in the amount of $1.85 million. Uh, upon completion of the project, ongoing costs associated with operations and maintenance will be performed and funded through streets maintenance. Uh, funding requirements for operations and maintenance of uh, infrastructure is reviewed and adjusted as required during the budget process. Uh, a little bit of background. This project provides um, eight feet sidewalk, planter strip, uh, bicycle lanes, and street lights on the south side of Southwest Das Point Road from 21st Avenue Southwest to Southwest 312th Street. Upgrade existing pedestrian crossings and curve ramps at 21st Avenue Southwest to current ADA standards. Uh, extend reduced speed school zone through uh, the Southwest 312 Street intersection. And here is a vicinity map that's showing of that location. Um, the progress to today for um, complete tasks, we did the TOBO survey, utilities coordination, uh, NEPA applications, preliminary contract specifications, uh, project design to 85%. The ongoing tasks include 
WASTAP generalization plan approval, uh, NEPA approval, Lake Haven inter interlocal agreements, project design to 100%, and final contract specifications to 100%. The estimated cost is $2.6 million, which includes um, design, 170,000, uh, the construction cost of $1.385 million, and 10% uh, contingency, which is $180,000, uh, Lake Haven bid schedule and project administration cost, an estimate of $750,000, and construction management with which is 156,000. The available funding for this project is um, $2.6 million and is comprised of the following. We have um, the federal grants of $1.35 million, um, state grants of 500,000, and Lake Haven Water and Sewer Districts of $750,000. Uh, after receiving bids, the total project cost will be refined and presented to the committees and council for bid awards authorization. Uh, staff anticipate bidding this project in March 2021. Uh, construction is anticipated starting in spring 2021 and completion date will be fall 2021. Um, the options before committees are one, authorize staff to complete the design and bid the uh, Lakota Middle School safe route to school and return to LUTC and council for bid award, further reports and authorization. Uh, option two will be do not authorize staff to proceed with this project and provide direction to staff. The mayor uh, recommends forwarding option one to the January 5th, 2021 CD council consent agenda for approval and staff is available for any questions you may have. Back Thank you, Jeff. Any questions from anyone? Oh, I don't see any. Okay. All right. There are no any questions, then I will make a motion. Uh, Chair, I have a question yes. on regard to the uh, motion. Should I change the language on the uh, motion to uh, I move to forward the option one instead of proposed resolution to the January 5th, 2021 consent uh, agenda for approval? No, I agree. Didn't see that. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to make uh, that motion. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to second that, but I'll, I'll wait till the official motion okay i will okay. repeat the motion uh mr Thank chair you. i move to forward the option one to the january 5th 2021 consent agenda for approval and i'll second that okay it's been motion with amendment for option one for council member trans second member council member moore need more discussion on that motion if hearing seeing none all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. Passes three three zero Thank you, Jeff. All right, thank you. We're down to item G, the South 320th Light Bulb Rehabilitation Project Acceptance. So John, okay. John, are you on? John is not on. This is Sarah. I'm covering for John tonight. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I am here to present the South 320th Street Flagpole Rehabilitation Project Acceptance. I'm Sarah Hamill, I'm the Capital Engineering Manager. The policy question in front of you tonight is should the council accept the South 320th Street Flagpole Rehabilitation Project as complete? And we have uh, before and after pictures and in the middle um, is the new flagpole. Financial impacts. So this is acceptance of construction as complete. Therefore, no additional funds are proposed to be, be spent as part of this agenda item. The background information is that uh, the, the project constructed an in-kind replacement of the flagpole with a white powder coat finish utilizing the existing foundation. 
the city council must accept the work as complete to meet state department of revenue state employment security department and state department of labor and industries requirements the south 320th street flagpole rehabilitation project is complete and the final amount was $22,634.02. This is $127,365,000 below the $150,000 budget that was approved by the council on March 17, 2020. The options to be considered are one, authorized final acceptance of the South 320th Street Flagpole Rehabilitation Project as complete in the amount of $22,634.02 as complete, or do not authorize final acceptance of the South 320th Street Flagpole Rehabilitation Project as complete and provide direction to staff. The mayor recommends forwarding option one to the January 5th, 2021 city council consent agenda for approval. And I can answer any questions. Thank you, Sarah. Love that savings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, council member Martin Moore, you have a question. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation and, and that is an outstanding savings. Um, so I think I, I kind of want to refresh her a little bit. Um, and I forgot your um, your name. I'm so sorry. It's not popping oh. up on my screen. Sarah. Sarah. I should definitely know that name. That is the, the name of my wife, as Council President Honda is indicating. So, uh, yes. So, Sarah, um, somebody hit this poll. Correct. And... Um, this is what's caused us to get this far. Um, it was my understanding that their insurance or somebody was covering it. Can you speak to that? And I guess in my mind, I was logically thinking, well, they hit the poll. They should, I mean, the city shouldn't have to pay any single taxpayer dollar on this. Um, but help me understand that side of it. And then I may have a follow up, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sure. So yes, the city is seeking um, to uh, obtain reimbursement from the parties at fault. Um, so I don't know the specifics, but yes, sure. they are looking to recoup that 22,000. Perfect. Okay. Well, okay. That was it. So the, the cost of this is going to be $22,000, um, even though we budgeted more. And uh, the person that's at fault uh, will be uh, the uh, will be addressed in one way or another. Yes. Okay. So in the end, taxpayer dollars will not be going into this thing. Okay. Sure. If they're successful, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Sure. All right, Council President Honda. Thank you. I have two questions. And actually, the first is there was, uh, you know, our staff did the work around it. <clears throat> so that that money hopefully will be um, also reimbursed to us by the driver or his insurance, whatever is possible, because staff took time away from other projects to work on this, and that did cost money. Um, my question though is, is there any way we could put a barrier around perhaps that traffic island or the flagpole itself so that this doesn't happen again? Yes, um, so address your, to address your first question, the cost does include staff labor charges, so that is in there. And we are looking and um, I believe the um, streets department has purchased uh, four bollards that will go in two on each side to um, protect the flagpole. Um, so sort of the sacrificial bollard, um, you know, hope is that that would prevent further damage um, or, or any damage to the new flagpole. Oh, good. Um, good to know because it is, it is in the middle of the street. Yes, so. it is. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Sir, are those ballers, are those concrete or how do they, you know, yeah, give so me an idea they're how they're, actually, what they're going to be? 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Steel bollards. Um, and so we'll um, embed them in, you know, have a footing and um, they're, I think we decided to go with not a, a like a blaring yellow, but you know, a more subdued color so they won't <laughs> detract. Okay. Thank you. Council member Moore, you had your hand up. Did you have another question? Unlike the mayor, I don't drink, so I don't need 15 cents, but I'll take a quarter from you. Anyway, any other questions? Uh, no other questions? You, you, you don't ahead. drink soda. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say that. <laughs> Thank you, Council President. You, know, you, uh, you can collect that money from my retirement account. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a great way to end deficits of any kind, you know. It is. Well, we got we got money from the flagpole now, money from you for putting your hand up. Okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I think, I think we've questions? all done it. <laughs> yeah, I have. I gave my yeah. fifteen cents. Remember? Okay. Uh, if there are any other questions, I will take motion. I'll move to forward option one to the January fifth, twenty twenty one consent agenda. For approval. I'll second, second that. All righty. Uh, motion by Councilmember Moore, second by Councilmember Tran. Any other discussion on the motion? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Approved unanimously. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome. We're going to move on to item H authorization to accept grant funding for transportation improvement projects. Sir Rick Perez. Rick? Okay, so everybody see that? Yes. All right. Yes. Excellent. So um, the policy question before the council is, should council accept grant money? Um, so uh, you may recall from last week's special session that uh, we have a road diet project proposed on South 288th Street um, from SR 99 to 34th Avenue South. Um, it would uh, restripe 288, the four lane sections to three lanes, putting in bike lanes, um, install some mid block crosswalks as shown here. It would rebuild the traffic signal at military and 288, which is one of the three oldest traffic signals in the city. It's over 50 years old now. Wow. Um, and uh, associated with that, we would still be preserving a westbound right turn lane from 288th to northbound on military to handle that uh, heavy movement in the morning peak hours. Um, so we had uh, proposed, uh, we had applied for um, $2 million from Transportation Improvement Board for um, these improvements and we have been granted that. I will also, I'm proud to announce and very excited to announce that the city match will now drop another million because we also got word today on the same project list, we ranked number one in the state for um, the pedestrian and bicycle safety program um, that will provide one million towards this project. So, um, very excited about that. Um, so that's what we're looking at for city matches is 500,000. So options considered, option one, approved to accept the transportation grant funding from transportation improvement board and authorize the mayor to execute related agreements or two, do not approve to accept the grant funding and provide direction to staff. The mayor's recommendation is option one, to accept that transportation grant funding. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rick, for the presentation. Uh, I'll take that money too, that's great. Good job. Any questions from anyone? I don't see any. Okay, I will take a motion then. Mr. Chair, um, I move to forward option one to the January 5th, 2021 consent agenda for approval. Is there a second? Second. It's been motioned by Council Member Tran, seconded by Council Member Moore. Any other discussion on the motion? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Rick, you have the second there. The next one, too. Item I, I believe. Ordinance on school speed limit ordinance amendment. Yes. Thank you. So the policy question here. I'm sorry. What? Your screen is acknowledged right now. Oh, dear. Are we share? Oh, new share. Resume. Oh, resume. Okay. I'm sorry. More technical challenges for me. Okay. So the policy question is, should the city council approve an ordinance to set school speed limits? So um, as Jeff Hahn was describing earlier, we have the Lakota Safe Route to School project on Dash Point Road. As part of that, we had proposed to expand the school speed limit, 20 mile an hour speed limit, which currently is shown in the yellow. That's the extent of it now and extend that to include um, all approaches to the intersections of both uh, Dash Point Road and Southwest 312th Street and at 21st Avenue Southwest, which uh, the bike and ped folks at WASHDOT were quick to agree that that was a great idea. However, um, we have to have an ordinance that specifies um, speed limits, and the fact is WASHDOT has to approve a school zone speed limit so they are requesting an ordinance to make that happen. So um, we are undergoing that analysis as we speak. Um, and so this is the language we've proposed to um, revise code section 830, which creates a new section to allow the public works director to determine locations for 20 mile per hour school zone speed limits. And there was some outdated language in there as well. So we are replacing some outdated references um, that don't really affect the meaning just for clarification. So um, options considered, one, approve the draft ordinance or two, do not approve the draft ordinance and provide direction to staff. The mayor's recommendation is option one to approve the draft ordinance. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rick. Any questions from committee members at all? None. Uh, Council President Honda, you have a question. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, I do. Thank you. Rick, um, is there any way that this speed limit in front of Federal Way High School on Pack Highway could be reduced when students are present? Um, yeah, we'd also have to get washed out approval for that on Pack Highway. Um, we had a discussion about that. You re may recall a few years ago that a school bus hit a uh, school mm -hmm. uh, a scholar on the way, and uh, that that raised the question from the school district about whether we should do that. Um, it's always a challenge when you're in higher speed limit areas to get people to slow down to 20 miles per hour, especially on a facility as wide as Pack Highway um, or, and transitioning between a 40 and a 45 zone. Um, so we could pursue that. My guess is it would not achieve very good compliance if we could get it approved by WASHDOT, which I also question. Um, so. Uh, I, I think it would be, I understand the intent, um, and I just think it would be hard to pull off. Um, and even if we could, you know, WashDOT could be a hang up on that. Hmm. Okay. Um, you know, if you're there in school is getting out, there is a lot of students that yep. cross that street and we don't always you know see the best common sense used by some of our students as they're crossing the street but i would sure hate to see anyone else hurt over there especially with the cars that go so fast because not all of them follow that speed limit some of them go even faster yes um, and typically changing the numbers on the sign does not make those highly non-compliant drivers all of a sudden comply. True. Uh, so it's it's a mixed bag for sure. 
Um, frankly, I, I worry less about the high school than a lot of the elementary schools, even though we've done just about everything we can. Um, if you want to see massive law breaking by drivers, just hang out at any elementary school at bell time. Um, it's, it gets pretty crazy. Um, so, and yeah. you know, those kids don't have nearly as much judgment either. So, um, that's frankly, I worry about that a lot more, especially at the schools that are unfortunately placed on arterials like Twin Lakes, for instance. Yeah. Or, uh, Sahali. Yes. You know, we had a terrible accident there before the doors even opened for school. Um, yeah. But, right, school safety is always a, a priority and a, a concern. Anytime I hear sirens when, uh, like, Decatur's getting out, I always, always hope that it's not someone has hit a student. So, all right, thank you. Thanks. Rick, is there, and, and the, to go to the question uh, that Council President Honda is saying, and I don't know because I haven't been around there for a while since my kids got out of school from uh, any of the schools, but how many of the community resource or the school resource officers are there? Does anyone, Rick, do you know at all? I don't know. Um, uh, I recall at one point there was at least one per high school and middle school, but I don't know that that is the case at this point in time, or if it ever was, frankly. Okay. I just kind of wanted, maybe we can get to ask them that question and maybe they can put that on the radar, you know, once school is back in session again. So, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any, so I will take a motion. Mr. Chair, uh, I move to forward the proposed ordinance to first reading on January 5th, 2021. Thank you. I will second that. Okay. It's motion by Councilmember Tran, seconded by Councilmember Moore. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. We're on to item J. Uh, award concrete beveling services trip hazard removal contract and that is Desiree. Uh, good evening, Chair Peruso, committee members, and members of council. There we go. So the policy, oh, let me hit the right one here. There we go. <laughs> the policy question is should city council award the concrete beveling trip hazard removal contract to the lowest responsive, responsible bidder. So sidewalk maintenance, um, including trip hazard removals is uh, something that the city is responsible for. Um, given our uh, ADA transition plan, we have gone out and done a lot of inspection of our various sidewalks. We estimate there's at least over $200,000 of beveling needed on just the arterial network alone. And we don't have enough staff resources to complete this work uh, in a very timely manner. So what uh, beveling looks like is on the left there, you see what a raised sidewalk panel looks like and the trip hazard. And then the beveling that takes place is uh, with a saw or grinder and basically cuts it flush with the next panel. And also in the case of this project, we have requested to make sure that the slope uh, that is left by the grinding or cutting, it meets ADA standards. So the way that we uh, procured uh, for this project is a process that's called piggybacking allowed by state law where one jurisdiction can take advantage of another jurisdiction's procurement process. And the city of Seattle did a procurement process for the same scope of services. Uh, Precision Concrete Cutting Incorporated was the lowest responsive responsible bidder. So we will enter into our own limited works contract, public works contract, and which is a not to exceed amount of $35,000 uh, for the services 
um, using the same bid prices that they provided uh, to the city of Seattle. And for the budget, um, the Streets 101 Maintenance Fund, which is funded from motor vehicle excise tax and general fund money, has a line item in there that we can use um, as it makes sense for professional services such as this. So options considered is to award the concrete beveling trip hazard removal contract to Precision Concrete Cutting Incorporated, the lowest responsive responsible bidder in the amount of $35,000 and authorize the mayor to execute the contract. Our option two is reject all the bids and provide direction to staff. Uh, the mayor recommends awarding the contract to Precision Concrete Cutting Incorporated, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Desiree, for the presentation. I do have one question. So I know that most of the time the, the concrete is because of the roots, the plant roots. So at one point, do, the, do we kind of figure that that tree needs to go? If all, uh, or, yeah, or and you're right. Majority of the time it has to do with the adjacent tree roots. Um, for the most part, we try to keep the tree in place. Uh, we will cut away the roots uh, as long as it's nothing um, major uh, that will cause the tree to um, have to be removed. We generally try to keep it in place. But you're right, we'll be back in five, six, seven <laughs> years <laughs> to either regrind it um, or at a point where we have to replace the panel and truly um, pull the tree out. So um, it's a it's a battle. Uh, we do have um, several places where the trees were placed in planter strips that weren't large enough for as large as the trees are today. Uh, they were probably maybe not the right tree because there are trees that do better under a streetscape type of scenario than others. Uh, and then there's also something that can be installed that will help prevent this type of heaving, which is called a root barrier. And I don't believe that uh, those were utilized um, when all, many of these very large mature trees uh, have grown up. So, okay, because I, I, yeah, I know eventually those where they have to come out or something else have to happen. But thank you. Any questions from the committee members at all? Hearing, seeing none. Council President Honda, you have one. Yes, thank you. Desiree, is this happening all around the city? Are you going into neighborhoods to do this or just on the arterials? Uh, we are prioritizing the arterials um, and especially in areas where we know we have higher pedestrian traffic. Um, because you know that's where our highest risks are, and um, we need to be able be able to prioritize uh, those areas. Honestly, we uh, we have not done all of our survey work for all of the the neighborhoods. So although we do hear and get calls about various trip hazards in neighborhoods, we don't know the extent, and that's the majority of our sidewalk network in terms of probably linear footage. So um, it'll be interesting to see as we go into the neighborhoods um, how much more will need to be done. At the same time, though, um, many of the neighborhoods, we are discovering that the tree roots are that are causing some of this heaving are private trees. And so if it happens to be a tree that is on private property that has not been maintained in such a way that is causing damage to the sidewalk, it becomes the responsibility of the adjacent property owner. So um, that we have been uh, working through as well as we get calls in. Um, so if, let's say, there's a sidewalk that needs to be taken care of because a homeowner's tree has caused damage to it, if an individual were to fall and get hurt, is the homeowner responsible for the injury or the city? Uh, I am not an attorney, so I'm not going <laughs> to speak to that. Okay. Um, as far as what our code says and as far as my work with uh, Mr. Rhodes, um, that, you know, it becomes a matter of notification. 
And so that's why we are working at making sure um, when we get notified, then we evaluate it that we're notifying the homeowners of their responsibility. And um, okay. looks like uh, Eric is ready to jump in for me here. Yes, okay, I thank you. concur with uh, Desiree's explanation. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Chair. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Customer thank you. One. Desiree, um, um, we're obviously going to be um, awarding this to the um, – I'm looking for the – she here um to precision concrete cutting ink um so um where are they based out of uh locally i'm gonna speak out of turn i believe they have some offices in either puyallup or kent area but their corporate uh, offices are in utah actually but they kind of have satellite you know, offices. branch. Yeah. Branch like satellite offices where they actually conduct the work out of. And they've done a lot of work in Seattle area. I would imagine. They have done a lot of work. They've been on contract with Seattle for the last couple of years under this procurement. And in fact, we actually um, worked with them a little bit this past year and had them do some work for us. Um, because if we could keep it under a certain dollar amount, um, we can go ahead and utilize them without coming to council. But because uh, we wanted to be able to utilize them more, uh, that's why we are here today for this award. Okay, great. No, I appreciate that. Thanks, Desiree. And if you want to see their work, <laughs> uh, they have been working on... Uh, so Campus Drive, 336 and 340th, they started at Hoyt Road and they have made their way almost all the way to the Aquatic Center on both sides. And so you can see if you happen to walk along there, uh, some of their work that they accomplished uh, this past fall. Great. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? I see none. I'll take a motion. I uh, move uh, to forward option one to the January 5th, 2021 consent agenda for approval. Second. Second. Motion by Councilmember Moore, second by Councilmember Tran. Any other questions or comments on motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Pass you dance me. Thank you, Desiree. You have the next one, though, too. So you're still with us. I know. Uh, I have to share my screen again. Sorry. Okay, hold on. I don't care. Ordinance, Amendments Federal Way Revised Code, Chapters 4 and 19 related to wireless communication facilities. All right. So um, the changes that uh, we're looking at today primarily impact um, uh, Title 19, which is the zoning code. However, a lot of what we're talking about today is a small wireless, and that's located, uh, hopefully mostly located, um, aiming for to be located within the rights of way, which is definitely under the purview of Public Works Department, which is why we've been very heavily involved. But I'm lucky enough to have a doc here as well today uh, that if you need to jump in on any <laughs> zoning issues as well. So let me get this one to the slideshow view. There we go. OK. All right, so I got you moving too far. There we go. Policy question. Uh, should the proposed amendments to Federal Way Revised Code Titles 4 and 19 as related to wireless communication facilities be recommended? for approval. So background information. I don't know how many times you're going to see this, but you're going to see this a lot, probably even more, because we even have more uh, industry coming in uh, for various uh, approvals. But uh, we all are very much um, attached to our wireless uh, 
phones and tablets and other things and other things that we've been doing even is uh um, our smart cities our our new street lights led street lights that we just installed um, have nodes that uh, wirelessly communicate back to us so we know if the lights on or off or having problems so this has just grown exponentially and i think that um, mr bush at the beginning of the meeting gave you some really big percentage number of how much this has grown. So the backbone of this of this wireless network consists of the macro towers that you see there on the right, the small cells, which again are more, um, more street light size and densify the network, and then the fiber optic cable that uh, runs underground and uh, gets the data everywhere it needs to go. So some background information, as this all grew, industry came to the federal government and requested to be able to install small wireless facilities in 2016. And the cities had to prepare to figure out how are we gonna accommodate these small wireless facilities um, and small wireless growth within our cities. And at the same time, the Federal Communication Commission or FCC, they issue an order that basically makes the cities um, come up with guidelines and be able to accommodate uh, the small wireless within within the cities and that we were required to identify the zoning, the permitting, uh, stick to their timelines or shot clocks um, and develop aesthetic standards uh, for allowing them within our rights away. So we did a lot of work um, from 2018 to present the city has diligently developed and implemented code and design standard to meet the federal and state laws requiring accommodations for small wireless facilities. So um, the impacted titles or chapters, uh, 4.22 outlines franchise application requirements. It was also updated to match the required timelines. Uh, 4.23 outlines what is required for small wireless permitting. 4.24 implements those timelines or shot clocks that we are required to meet in order to um, give them permits in a timely manner. And then revised code 19.256 implemented and confirmed zoning requirements, permitting timelines, and established interim design and aesthetic standards. And the reason why we kept them as interim is because there's just been a there's been um, some lawsuits related to this, um, some challenges, and so we kept some of this uh, some of these guidelines interim because it seemed like everything was changing month to month. So the proposed amendments that you'll see are a consolidation of all the wireless code into one chapter. Um, many of these amendments are existing code, but they're just being moved to another section uh, because wireless, regardless if it's in the right of way or if they do choose to go onto private property, we wanted them to meet um, similar standards and it made sense to try to consolidate all of it so we wouldn't have redundancies or conflicts between our own code. So what we are doing with the amendments is that Chapter 4. Point, or Title 4.22, we removed a redundant section related to application review timelines. That got moved to 19.256. 4.23 uh, refers to the small wireless permit requirements uh, that we moved into 19.256. 4.24 refers to eligible facilities request requirements, uh, which is the concept of that carriers can be, come in if they have existing facilities, we have to uh, allow for certain modifications, which are called eligible facilities requests. And that has been um, moved and consolidated to a new chapter, 19.257. Uh, 19.256 uh, was deleted and replaced because we moved so much from four point chapter four, we basically just started over um, and moved everything there and consolidated it. And then again, 19.257 is the new 
uh, chapter that covers the eligible facilities requests, both for the major wireless and the small wireless within and without the right of way. So why are these amendments so important? Well, because it's coming. <laughs> and we have to be able to allow reasonable and fair access to deploy small wireless within our city. And we have to outline how we expect it to look. Uh, we have worked very hard and spent millions of dollars in our rights of way, especially on our arterials and undergrounding uh, all of the, you know, non-electric, uh, you know, and electric uh, wires underground and we've beautified it. So we don't want somebody coming in and, you know, making it not look beautiful. <laughs> so on the left, uh, the left picture is what a small wireless um, or major wireless facility could look like on top of an existing wood utility pole. Uh, some of the things they tried to do to help conceal it or make it blend in is they put the wire that's coming up the pole inside a conduit. Uh, they paint the conduit brown to match the pole. Same with the uh, antenna equipment um, up at the top as well as some of the uh, the uh, equipment boxes down below, try to paint them so that they kind of blend in more. The middle one would be uh, a small wireless facility, more like that that we would see in our downtown. Um, not exactly, but you can see that you don't see all the wires, right? They're all coming up in the pole. The equipment could be in a box, might be, con might be hidden or, um, kind of covered up a little bit more by the banners. This top, the top part there is actually the antenna and it's uh, all enclosed in a shroud. And then the, then you have one on the right that you probably don't want to see at all. You've got multiple pieces of equipment. You've got wires that are kind of hanging out. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of consolidation or, uh, uh, sorry, aesthetic, uh, <laughs> aesthetic uh, anything happening there, standards that have been implemented. So that's why it's really important that we have these uh, amendments in place and this code in place. So what uh, is in the code uh, is permitting and timelines. It outlines everything that is needed in order to meet the federal timelines or shot clocks. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be in place for a uh, for a provider to come in. They have to have a franchise. They have to have a master lease, which is applicable if they're gonna use one of our street lights or city facilities. They have to have a small wireless permit, environmental review if applicable, and then a right of way permit in order to construct. So it's very important that we outline everything that is needed um, so that we are showing, showing all our carts, basically that if they can't have all of these things in order, then there's no way we're going to be able to meet the 60, 90 days that is required for us uh, to be able to provide them a permit. And again, that is required by law. The design standards uh, that are within the code prioritize where facilities should be located for major wireless facilities that we prioritize them to BPA towers, locate with something else on an existing pole, new poles being the the last resort. Small wireless um, also prioritizes putting facilities on existing poles, replacing an existing pole, and at the last resort, adding a new pole that has to meet city standards. We put safety um, uh, safety in place for the RF engineer affidavit for an emission that the emissions uh, for the radio frequencies fall within regulated health and safety standards. The facility also should meet clearance standards and ADA standards. New replacement poles is um, when we start looking at some of the aesthetic standards that we've included, the equipment should be concealed within the polar base or with the equipment and pole mounted cabinet should be concealed such as with a banner. We don't want any uh, ground mounted equipment for the small wireless um, antenna. And equipment box dimensions are detailed and outlined within these. Um, we talk about what is, we allow for modifications only 
uh, if they they can prove that something is not technically feasible. Um, and that's you kind of need that because technology is constantly changing. So as far as public outreach and comment, um, we did do uh, a programmatic SEPA with the issuance of a determination of non-significance. We provided the code to industry for review. So they've had this a couple of times. First, when we initially adopted the code and interim design standards in 2018 and 2019, they got to see our code as it exists today. Um, the new code that you have in your hands, they got two weeks ago. <laughs> And so before the planning commission meeting last week, they provided us um, their industry comments. In summary, um, they made sure that we are updating definitions so that they're consistent within our code as well as the current federal definitions, which again have been updated even in this past year. They would like to have a little more time um, for an active application to allow 90 days uh, for supplemental info um, other items that industry commented on um, in the code that's in front of you is some of the dimensions and offsets, uh, quantities of equipment. They want to make sure that we're matching technology and the federal law allowances. They would like a little bit more leeway to meet standards if feasible. They wanted to update notice requirements only for environmental uh, process as required and for notice of construction, which is kind of consistent with our right of way permit process. And then um, something that you heard from Mr. Bush at the beginning of the meeting, who represents AT&T, uh, that they would like us to consider um, changing our zoning so that the major wireless macro facilities, as we call them, could have options for being cited in residential zones. I'd like to point out that we did not change that part of the code or propose that to be amended. I think it's important, but it's a pretty big deal and it's not something that uh, should be taken lightly. And after talking with the planning commission, their recommendation was that that could be taken on next year as a change to be reviewed. Um, as part of their um, normal kind of Title 19 amendments, but that at this time, because of the timing that is required to get this uh, uh, these amendments adopted, that uh, they just wouldn't have time to review that those uh, zoning issues at this time. So, industry comments, how to address. So, we have been working since last week, Thursday, Friday, today, uh, to update and clean up the code that's in front of you as needed. Um, as I hopefully I shared, or you got the impression of, nothing that we saw within their comments uh, was you know, really a fatal flaw or something that we didn't believe that we could work through. Um, we will be then going to the Planning Commission. They continued their public hearing from December 2nd, and uh, we will review the updated code with them next week, December 16th. And then we would bring the final version to city council for first reading on January 5th, 2021. So again, this is the schedule. And then the red was something that got added as of last week because they continued the public hearing. So we had our first public hearing uh, last uh, part, we opened the public hearing last week. Today, we're here for LUTC review. Uh, the Planning Commission will continue the public hearing on this uh, with a clean copy of the updated code with the industry comments addressed. And then we propose to go to City Council for first reading on January 5th, and then second reading January 19th. Um, the reason why we're pushing this um, and trying to get this done is that the interim standards expire in January. And we are required to have those in place. And we're pretty confident that with the work that we're doing and um, the modifications that we can work through with industry that we can make that we can make that deadline and and keep uh, keep moving forward with the process. 
So the options considered for you for <laughs> land use and transportation is to forward the ordinance to city council for review and first reading on January 5th, 2021, or two basically is no action. Um, because certainly city council and as a point of order, um, Eric uh, can jump in and kind of talk about that. You know, we're allowed to bring things, you know, straight to, to city council um, because there are so many modifications to this cur current um, ordinance that is before you tonight. Um, but the mayor's recommendation was that we do need to uh, adopt these uh, proposed amendments to titles four and 19 uh, related to the wireless communication facilities. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Desiree. Uh, I, I had a question on the uh, on the any of the public hearings, anything worth commenting on or worthwhile that came up or noted at all? Can you comment um, on that at all? You know, I think the the major thing, and Mr. Barroso was able to share with that. And again, there were there were only um, two people who spoke at the public hearing, and that was. Um, Mr. Bush, who represented AT&T, and then Ms. Allen, who represents Verizon Wireless. Both of them also provided us with their written comments um, and suggested edits to the code. So um, probably the biggest major thing, uh, which is what Mr. Bush shared at the beginning of the meeting, was that he would strongly encourage the city to review zoning uh, for the major wireless facilities uh, to be allowed to come into residential zones. Um, and as he shared at the beginning of the meeting, because, because it's become so important, you know, people are, are relying, especially us all being at home um, and our children being at home learning um, that it has just become critical to make sure that there is reliable uh, internet service. And some, some people, that's all they have is, uh, you know, wireless, you know, that I know some students have been handed a, you know, a, a Wi-Fi puck to take home, and that's how they're accessing school. So um, the, the Planning Commission was, you know, was open um, to relooking at that part of the code, but again, that's not something that is in the current amendment. Okay, because too, even on that line, you know, um, I would I would hope that when they get to that point, if we get to that point, that I know that density has a lot to do with some of those sometimes, but there's outlying areas that aren't as dense um, in some of the areas around that those folks need the same type of service, you know, because I know that. Uh, case in point, like when Century Links puts their fiber optics in, they go by by density of, of a population, and sometimes that doesn't work uh, for everybody. But there's also folks that need the same type of thing, even though there's less houses around them. So I would I would hope that that was kind of looked at when that comes too. So thank you. Absolutely. Any questions from the committee members at all? Okay, I don't see any. Council President Honda. Thank you. Desiree, do other cities allow these in the residential zones? Uh, as far as the macro facilities or small wireless? Either. I believe so. And generally, um, small wireless, uh, I think, is allowed any anywhere um, because it's going to be within the right of way and replacing like a street light. So they're not as obtrusive, right? They They can... Okay, can be in place, but they do need uh, the macro facilities um, to bolster up the network. So generally, my understanding is that the macro facilities are considered and would be allowed at, say, schools or churches or um, other types of development like that. So you can't put it in somebody's backyard. <laughs> um, okay. But within the residential area, generally there are schools, there are parks, uh, there are um, you know churches that uh, 
many times they cite a macro facility somewhere like that within a residential zone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? I don't see any. So if that's the case, I will take a motion. Mr. Chair, I move to forward uh, the proposed ordinance to the first reading on January 5th, 2021. Thank you. I will second that. Thank you. A motion by Councilmember Tran, seconded by Councilmember Moore. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, pass unanimously. Thank you, Desiree. Thank you, good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs> I know she's happy about that. Uh, item L, Ordinance Comprehensive Plan Amendment Rezone at Doc Anson. You have the floor, Doc. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Let me see if this is gonna work. One of the things that I've, I've found that can you see that? Yes, I see. Let me uh, enlarge that. All right. Doc, so hit slideshow on the top. Yeah, that's what it was good. It's in the middle on the orange bar. There you go. Thank you. And I'm looking for the flip. The right arrow on the bottom of your screen, or you can just click on the slide. I can go forward, but I was trying to flip the uh, screen. Uh, members of the uh, council, Mr. Chair, I want to start out by just saying that uh, I used to feel very comfortable in, in talking to 100 people and a council with a uh, slide presentation. So you have to forgive me. I actually had this slide presentation up, ready to go. Um, you have to forgive these old fogies that are having problems with tech, uh, technology and trying to uh, communicate with you. Um, the history, that this should go fairly quickly. Uh, the history of the, of the project, you've actually heard this before. You heard it in uh, September. It was brought before you in September. You brought it to uh, discussion in uh, October for business. You had further discussion on it. You had first reading in November. It was requested by the, it was requested by the applicant to postpone this or to continue this uh, to add another parcel to it. Um, it is, it is uh, for the parcel this little strand right here, underneath the art, uh, the proposal that was originally uh, given to you in September. The reason the applicants are asking for this part, this little parcel to be added to it is so that the uh, design of the buildings would actually be more compatible with, well, it'd be a nicer design because uh, our code requires that uh, the building not be any higher than 30 feet if it's closer than 100 feet to uh, RS-72, 
or single family zone. This little strand right here, because it was zoned RS72, was going to move the building way in here, which required the parking in this area and was going to squeeze their open space that they wanted in here. And the architect wished to keep three large trees in this particular area for the open space. We reviewed this and found that it was reasonable. And, uh, but because two other parcels were going to be added within 300 feet, uh, this has to come back before you. It has to go through the process that it went before. It's got to come to, uh, before the council on uh, January 5th and be approved or with second reading on January 19th. If you'll recall, this is proposed to be a an RM18. It's adjacent to uh, this multiple family here. It's also adjacent to a VC, which is uh, compatible with with our, it meets our comprehensive plan. Also, this rezone is adjacent to um, the park and ride facility that will exist in our comprehensive plan encourages development next to uh, the park and ride. It's also compatible with the adjacent or the kitty corner RM18, which is being proposed right here. This area through here the reason we were uh, making a proposal or suggesting that it be used, uh, this little strip right here would be added because this access easement does come up here and it would be added to this. This whole area in this spot is an open space. It will remain um, natural and it provides a natural buffer between the multiple family and the uh, single family resident residential development to the east. Therefore, it's compatible uh, with any type of development here because it's within 200 feet. It, there's about a 200 foot buffer between this point and, and the first point of development. Again, the land use policies encourage this compatibility of the existing structures. It also encourages uh, development and rezone next to multiple family commercial uh, transit areas. The items to consider, uh, as I stated, it's adjacent to the 1800 next to a transit stop. Natural area provides a natural buffer. The options for the LUTC to consider are the recommend amended amendment uh, to rezone the classification for approval or to recommend denial. Mayor recommends approval of the amended proposal. If you recall, your recommendation at the September 14th meeting was to move it forward for first reading um, or excuse me, to move it forward for business discussion to October 4th. And I'll answer any questions for you. Thank you, Doc. So I'll just clarify again to be sure that that, that buffer space there uh, for the way zoning is right now, that, that won't restrict, given that partial, that sliver there, will not restrict anything else to happening uh, if anything has to happen according to our zoning now. That's correct. That correct. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. The little, is any... is, the little sliver is just going to allow for the setback to, to have the building back so it can have a 35-foot height. Got it. Thank you, Doc. Any other questions? Questions? No, I don't see or hear any. Okay. All right. I will take a motion then. Anyone? Uh, Open it to chair. <laughs> yes, go ahead. <laughs> I was about to do uh, it, but I, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can make the motion. Uh, okay. I move to forward the proposed ordinance to the first reading on January 5th, 2021. I'll Thank second you. that. Ready, I have motion by Councilmember Tran, second by Councilmember Moore. Your discussion on the motion. You're in seeing that, all those in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you, Doc. 
Me too. All righty. That is unanimous. We move on to item M. Update on sound transit activities, and that's Ryan Midland again. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Chair Baruso, committee members, council president, and council members. Um, it's going to be a quick update tonight um, because most of the construction activity is slowed for the winter months. Um, on the Federal Way link extension, there is some uh, upcoming clearing and initial prep work for construction on either side of 272nd. The road itself is actually in the city of Kent, but they still sent a construction notice to the residents in Federal Way that live on the south side of 272nd. Uh, the work will be taking place primarily in the Mark Twain Elementary and South Star Lake Park and Ride. Um, there will be some lane closures coming up this week and as well as uh, some on-ramp closures as um, from that southbound I-5 on-ramp right there. Um, as for the rest of the city, so by city code, there's no lane closures allowed in the city center area over the holidays, so there won't be much work activity going on in that area. Similarly, on the 288th um, up to military haul route or hauling that they were doing with the dirt, uh, the weather has complicated it and they're like putting it on pause for the time being. And the other thing I wanted to bring up at this meeting uh, was just as a reminder that there's a community meeting with Donald Lipsky, the artist who did the sculpture first draft for the Federal Way Transit Center on December 9th at 5 p.m. Uh, the goal of the meeting is to get community feedback um, for his next sculpture idea for the transit center area. Uh, the meeting will be hosted by Sound Transit on Microsoft Teams. Um, there's been a notice to the Federal Way Mirror. They also sent one out to their listserv for the Federal Way Link extension, um, and it's been making some social media appearances as well. Uh, with regards to the Tacoma Dome Link Extension and the OMF South facility, uh, there's really no change to these projects since our study session on November 17th. So with that, I'll take any questions that there may be. Thank you, Ryan. And I, I, for those listening in and on, you know, December 9th, it's a great time to ask the artists and I, I invite all those folks to do that. So thank you very much for that. Uh, any questions from anyone? I have Council President Honda. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I was going to ask how Sound Transit was getting the word out to the public. So glad to hear what they're doing. And can you tell us what's happening at the Red Robin and Azteca site? There's a pile of debris that is still there. And do you know when construction will start on that site? So I don't know the exact timing on when construction will start the next phase in that area will be for them to drill uh, shafts for the future columns that are going in that area and there may be some staging as well uh, that takes place as far as timing it will likely be in quarter one or quarter two of 2021 um, but there as we get into these short-term situations the schedule be, can be quite dynamic um, as far as the rubble that you're referring to, that's the old ground up concrete from what was there. And usually what they do is they hold the concrete until they need to stabilize a surface somewhere and then they'll recycle that material um, for that purpose. Okay. Um, and at the meeting with the artist, which I'm very glad is happening, will the public have a chance to ask questions? The meeting is only scheduled for an hour so do you know the the format of the meeting i do not know the format of the meeting i know it's i know there's supposed to be a presentation but i believe that the intent of the artist is to receive feedback on what people think of when they think of federal way so i um, from my personal understanding of what that means i would expect that he wants to hear from the people that attend okay so but i can i can um reach out to their art director and uh, hopefully they'll get back to me quickly and I can send you a follow-up email tomorrow if you'd like. Oh, thank you. I'd appreciate that. If there are a lot of residents who attend the meeting and they have questions that go over an hour, will the meeting extend or will it be done right at, at six o'clock? So Sound Transit will be hosting. I 
don't know that answer. I know the artist is on the he's on the East Coast, so for him it'll be nine o'clock when it's right. it'll be getting late. And I I had originally asked if it could be pushed back to five thirty, just when we're getting off work. Five's kind of close, and that was the concern that was raised when we were discussing that. Um, I do know they've also they also have a survey link in the advertisement that's gone out that allows people to submit written feedback or written thoughts in advance of the meetings. Um, there's a set number of questions, but they're pretty broad questions. Um, so hopefully people have been seeing that second link that's on the various advertisements that have been circulating and um, been able to submit written responses that way. Okay, awesome. Hmm. All right, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Ryan? Guess not. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. All right, uh, that concludes our agenda on there. Uh, do we have any other business? Anyone want to mention any other business we need to talk about, discuss? See or hear any? So our next meeting for AUTC will be on January 4th at 5 o'clock. And it's not city city council chambers. It's probably going to be, I know it's going to be on Zoom again. So we probably <laughs> just need to start crossing that off, putting Zoom on there. You know, other I than live that. in hope. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> thank you, staff. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for the great meeting. Again, I will see everyone on the 4th for the meeting. And other than that, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you. Great. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Bye bye, everyone.